Arthur. This is your mother. But I want to tell you right here now, Barbara, you're a very, very good-looking little kid. You really are. You are speaking as one human being to another. Forget that you're an operator. I'm a supervisor. <laughs> Welcome to Long Dust. Can I help you? Yes, I read your ad. I'm interested in the $65 funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect duo. They were geniuses. They were the two best at what they did. You would try desperately in your own mind to, to keep up with them and to see where they were going, and uh, they were always light years ahead. They had an intellectual bent to stand up and uh, a sensibility that up uh, to that time really wasn't around. It's improvisational, it's intelligent, it's talking about where we live and what we're doing in a wonderfully mocking uh, way. They did things that were, you know, taboo by the, by the standards in those days uh, without shying from it. <laughs> Adultery was not addressed in those days, but they did it. Louise, where were you? I've been going out of my mind. God, please don't yell at me. This was not the kind of thing you did. But they did it. To be doing this terrible thing and to be late on top of it. All the sexual tension and all, you know, their brains are uh, fertile with anxiety. And I say that in the most affectionate way. They would uncover little dark niches that you felt but never had expressed. They expressed it for you. I've never felt so cheap. <laughs> Just think how I feel. Think how I feel. George is my best friend. Your best friend. He's my husband. Oh. He's one of the nicest, oh. kindest. He's a saint. They were totally adventurous and totally innocent in a certain sense. That's why it was accepted. There was a kind of social uh, vice that was existing around certain things. You simply didn't talk about sexual behavior. You know, it was a, it was a, uh, an era that was conspicuous for its dullness. You must remember that in the 1950s and the early 1960s, America celebrated those conventional institutions and conventional ways of life in an exaggerated fashion, I think. America took itself very seriously. It was, it was genuinely the Eisenhower years, and it was also a country reeling under the weight of what had happened with the McCarthy period. Remember, this is uh, civil rights days, concern about the nuclear bomb, and yet the country was simply not dealing with it. I think that we were held in thrall up until this point, and this was the beginning of the bust-out. Van Doren was what? my idol. He was my image, yes. yes. Well, yes, thank yes. heaven for the investigation. Oh, yes. When I feel worst, I say to myself, at least the government has taken a firm stand. Oh, well, they can't fool around with this the way they did with integration. No. <laughs> uh, this is a... Uh, uh, it's a moral issue. Yes! A moral yes. issue. Yes, yes! That it is a moral issue. A moral and issue. To me, that's always so much more interesting than a real issue. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, they, they were a new spirit, a new voice, and a new irreverence in television. It was a marvelous uh, moment, and I think perhaps historically one can even, from a, from a fairly grand view, say that it, it's from these kind of artists that genuine social change takes place. President Eisenhower reassures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. While the latest Russian satellite has sent a dog into space, our satellite program seems dogged with failure. The upsetting loss of six rockets last year doesn't faze Dr. Werner von Braun, who, along with 100 other German V-2 rocket scientists, are now heading up America's guided missile program and helping to keep America free. Frida, I'm home. Ah, good. Boy, am I starved. Oh, Werner, you look pushed. All day at the laboratory, I said to myself, 
I can't wait to get home to the little woman's cooking. Come, take off your shoes and put on your slippers and we watch some TV. I'm so happy our country is going ahead now faster, dearest, in the arms race. We Americans are doing better every day. Only today we took a giant step on Thor. Vanguard is looking better. If America, our country goes along like this, soon, darling, we will rule the world. Yeah, today America, tomorrow the world. God bless America! They were like music. And like I said, I was introduced to Martin Record. That it was something like a song. You could hear it over and over and over and appreciate how one thing went into another like a like a melody it's beautiful it has a fantastic piece yes it's serene it has a kind of mathematical certainty that's almost yes. sensual yes. to me yes an order a finality yes. finally i used to listen to those records you know over and over and over i used to play them at night and go to sleep to them would sit late at night doing the kind of what passed for South Dakota beatnik thing of, you know, burning some crayons into a Coke bottle and trying to make a candle out of it, dimming the lights and listening to Nichols and May. And it was like a voice from another planet somehow. What a shock when I, when I discovered Nietzsche and, and he oh. said that in a way. In many ways, when I read Thus Spake Zarathustra, yes. a whole world opened for me. I know exactly what you mean. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Oh, did that happen to you I know too? exactly what oh. you mean. I, I had never known such things existed, yes, yes, you know. Yes, I had never actually heard someone deliver irony just in the tone of their voice and sarcasm and satire. There was something in the tone that was very, very new. Scalpel. Scalpel. Gauze. Gauze. More gauze. More gauze. More gauze. More gauze. More gauze. More gauze. A little more gauze. We don't have any more gauze. That's all the gauze? Yeah. I don't know what happened. We had a small roll of oh, gauze. Give me a sponge. A sponge. Clamp. You have the clamp. Suture. We have a suture. Edith. Yes? I love you. One thing that really distinguished them from what had come before in terms of comedy teams is that they were still, that it was verbal. I don't even know where they recorded half these things, but... In some ways, it was like radio, because you could uh, supply you know, the images, you could supply the characters they were doing in your head. You, uh, you like Andre Castellanos, Miss Lemus? Well, I uh, really listen mostly to semi-classical yes, music. Yes, yeah, just, that, know, me too. I just got a whole Castellanos thing playing uh, Footlight Favorites, a lot of the oh, semi-class yeah. stuff. I, I really love music. I mean, I don't understand it, but I know what I like. I'd I like really... to play it for you if you're interested. I don't know, you know, I could just hop up there and give it a whirl. I don't know. To your apartment? Yeah, right. You know, my wife is up in the mountains. She goes every summer. She goes up to the mountains. And I, I uh, you know, I just rattle around in the big apartment all by myself. Oh, gee. <laughs> it's an awful nice record. I, I just thought... The phrase know. mob and snob appeal is very apt um, because it was so intelligent. Their use of language, their appearance, their style had snob appeal. A popper, uh, uh, popper, ladies and gentlemen, is what uh, his very, very dear friends uh, called Hemingway. I was just uh, uh, talking to a very, very dear friend of his and mine. This is a very old, very close, very wonderful friend. Uh, Albert Schweitzer. <laughs> Al's a lot of laughs. Uh, I, I love to have him on the show. He's, he's always ready with a quip. You know, I haven't seen the old son of a gun for a while. I think he's in Africa. You know, I told him, Al, baby, you are nuts. There is no money in Africa. But he went and we haven't heard from him since. What do you say, sweetheart? <clears throat> oh, so Al is in Africa. <laughs> Well, you know, I, what is there to say about Al Schweitzer? <laughs> He's just as far as I am concerned. I mean, I personally have never dated him. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he is, I hear, the greatest and uh, just a real... The uh, aware, more sophisticated audience, of course, appreciated them at, a le at, 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 a, at multiple levels that perhaps others didn't. <laughs> Into Papa, now you I saw him at the house of another very old, very close, very, this is a very dear, very wonderful friend, uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, uh, Bert, 
Bert is a heck of a good kid. I love, I tell you the thing about, uh, Bert is not like a lot of your philosophers. By that I mean he's not pushy, you know. And that is a terrific thing to see. We're all crazy about Bert. What do you say, sweetheart? Well, actually, Jack, I think you're right. How about that? No, I do, because as far as I am concerned, personally, I think that a pushy philosopher is always a drag. It never got smarter. It never got wittier. It never, in fact, the first thing to go was the wit after Nichols and May. I don't, I, it's funny, I, I know it's very smart, but, but that's death to comedy. I think it was just plain funny. Biggest comedy find of the year. Two of the most talented people among us. There are a pair of bright lights in the comedy horizon. Very clever. Okay, everybody, I have finally persuaded Mike and Elaine to do something for us. Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Here are Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Our guest tonight is the quintessential Southern writer, Mr. Alabama Glass. Apologize. <laughs> there was a wonderful skit about uh, Truman Capote or Tennessee Williams, but that was absolutely breathtaking. There was one line in that that I can't remember now. That, uh... Before the action of the play begins, Nanette's husband, Raoul, <laughs> has committed suicide. <laughs> on being unjustly accused of not being homosexual. Unjustly accused of not being a homosexual. That was the line. Dear Barry, uh, I'm sure Darling, 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 will you please? Oh, thank you, Barry, I'm terribly sorry. Answer this one. Carried away. Dear Helping Heart, I have been going with the same man for the last 14 years. <laughs> Last week, I got the shock of my life. There, sitting at a sidewalk cafe, was my intended with another woman. I asked him what was the meaning of this. In reply, they both stood up and gave me such a merciless beating. <laughs> Even the waiters were shocked. It was so broad, so broadly appealing uh, to, the, uh, to anybody. You know, I mean, when they talked about mothers, they talked about your mother as well as theirs. Hello. Hello, Arthur. This is your mother. Do you remember me? <laughs> Mom, I was just going to call you. Is that a funny thing? You know that I had my hand Arthur, on the phone. you were was... supposed to call uh, me last uh, Friday. Mother, honey, I know. I just didn't have a second, and I could cut my Arthur, throat. I was. I sat I... by that phone uh, all day Friday. Uh, honey, I was working. I and just all have... day Friday night. Darling, I was in the lab. And all and I... day Saturday. Mom, I, I and all the... day Sunday. Mom, And I... your father finally said to me, Phyllis, eat something. You'll faint. I said, no, Harry, no. I don't want my mouth to be full when my son calls me. Mom. And you never called. Mother, I was sending up a rocket. I didn't have a second. Well, it's always something, isn't it? All right, honey, look, please. You know, Arthur, no, I'm sure that all the other scientists there have mothers. And I'm sure that they all find time after their breakfast or before their count off, Down. to pick up a phone and call their mother. Honey, listen, now you have me on and the And you phone. know how I worry. Well, that's the point. I, I read in the paper that you're still losing them. Mother. <laughs> mother, I don't lose them. I nearly went out of my mind. Honey, listen, I want I thought, what if they're taking it out of his pay? All right. <laughs> That's it, Mom. Wait, I just so please, let me I tell me how you are, Mother. Tell me how you are. How are you? I'm sick. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to hear it. What's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> well, you know what it is, Arthur. Yeah. It's the same thing it's always been. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's yeah. my nerves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, 
I went to the doctor. Well, of course, yeah. And yeah. he told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, listen, Mrs. White, mm, mm, you yeah. are a very nervous, yeah, yeah. very high-strung woman. Yeah, well, God knows that's true. <laughs> and you cannot stand the slightest aggravation. Well, no. Well, that's so I said, I'm doctor, I know that. Yeah, I know, yeah. and you know, I do, mm, I know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. said, uh, yeah. but you see, doctor, yeah. I have this son. <laughs> And uh, he's very busy, and it's the truth, he is, he's busy. I said, you see, doctor, he's too busy to pick up a phone and call his mother. Mom, honey, I Arthur, want you to tell me... when no I said that to him, that man turned pale. Right. <laughs> mother... He said, Mrs. White, I have been a doctor for 35 years. Darling... And I've never heard of a son too busy to call his mother. I know, Mom. That's but just what he said to me, Arthur. I know. And uh, that man is a doctor. <laughs> mother... <coughs> Please, would tell me, what did the doctor say they're going to do with you? Well, I may be in the hospital for a while, so... The uh, hospital? Yes. But wh wh what are they going to do? Well, they'll x-ray my nerves. <laughs> Mother, why don't you let me know? All no, you have to do is drop me a I don't want to aggravate you. Don't uh, aggravate yourself. You Never mind about myself? me, darling. Please, listen, about you. How is your hangnail? <laughs> Mother, listen to me, please, please, just don't worry. Arthur, what does that mean? Honey, what does that mean, don't worry? Well, nothing, actually. I just, I don't know. I <laughs> said the first thing that came into my head. <laughs> listen to me, Arthur. I'm a mother. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And I... <laughs> listen. What's the use of talking, you know? You're very young. Someday, someday, honey, you'll get married. Mom. And you'll have children of your own. Mom, please. And honey, when you do, I only pray that they make you suffer the way you're making them. <laughs> That's all I pray, Arthur. That's a mother's prayer. <laughs> Okay, Mom, thanks for calling. You're very sarcastic. Mother, I am doing my best here. Now, you call. I tried to explain to you that I was busy. You will not I, listen. I don't hit me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I bothered you when you were so busy. Believe me, I won't be around to bother you much longer. And listen, I hope I didn't make you feel bad. Are you kidding? I feel awful. Oh, honey, if I could believe that, I'd be the happiest mother in the world. Well, mother, what do you think? I feel rotten. Oh, then, Arthur, honey, why don't you call me? Honey, you know, I know that I nag you. You got a nagging mother. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm kidding. But, honey... <laughs> you know, you're my baby. And listen, you're the only baby I've got. And I'll tell you something, when you, when you get to be 100 years old, you're still going to be my baby, you know? And when you don't call me, honey, I can't help it. I just, I worry. And is that so hard to just pick up a phone and call your mommy? Is it? Oh, please, baby. Please. Yeah, well, I will, I promise. <laughs> Oh, honey, if you do, you make your mommy so happy. Well, if my mommy's happy, then I'm happy. <laughs> oh, thank you, baby. And mommy wants to wish you lots of luck with your rocket. Thank you, mommy. <laughs> and you remember that your mommy loves you? I love you too, mommy. <laughs> Goodbye, baby. Goodbye, mommy. Nani, nani, nani. Television made them a national attraction overnight because the whole nation saw what we would see in a little cabaret and people had never seen this. It just took over completely and the press were just completely, totally knocked out and suddenly they were like overnight stars. 
What you were seeing on television with Mike and Elaine was really quite daring. It was a breakthrough. It was a level that simply hadn't been expressed in public terms before, in front of an audience or on television. The Academy of Television Arts and Sciences presents the 11th Annual Emmy Award. I mean, they were in the swim then as new young stars. The winner in New York is Omnibus. Omnibus. It was a wonderful show, and its producers had asked Mike and Elaine to come on, and that was the beginning of the career of Nichols and May. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to congratulate on behalf of all of you here the winners thus far. And may I say that on an evening like this, we're very proud to be Americans. We recognize how fortunate we are. Fortunate that these men and women can say what they believe, and that you who listen to them, if you don't like it, can turn to another channel. Thank you and good night. And now to present the next award from New York, Elaine May of the comedy team of Mike Nichols and Elaine May. <laughs> gentlemen, I am very proud to be able to present the next award. It is a special award, special not only in that it's not listed tonight in any of the categories, but also in that it's the first award of its kind ever to be presented by the Academy. There will be a lot said here tonight about excellence and the creative, the artistic, and the skillful will all be recognized and rewarded. But what of the others in this industry? <laughs> Seriously, there are men in the industry who go on, year in and year out, quietly and unassumingly producing garbage. <laughs> tonight's special award to the man who has been voted the most total mediocrity in the industry, Lionel Gluck. Assumingly creating garbage. It's probably the most, you know, the best awards takeoff I'd ever seen. And it really has this kind of, because the way he goes all the way through and the award and being that overly sincere and admitting to mediocrity in the best way you can. And, and he has that look that way before Prozac, you know, 25 years before, just happy to be a flaming asshole. When I saw that piece, I thought, gee, I could use this. <laughs> How old is this tape? Who remembers it? <laughs> Someone told me that they cut it on the West Coast where it would have the most impact, or the least, where people are going, oh, damn it, he's right. I love it's true. I always agree with it. Always making fun of us. What? However smart it got, it always stayed funny. It never got smug. And that's, uh... So you had a lot of smart people talking about it. And you could approach it from a smart place, but you could also approach it from a dumb place. Fuck. 
Claudine. Claudine, my dear. Claudine, my dear. Claudine. Dearest. Forgive me, dearest. You're snoring, Claudine. Are you crazy? I wasn't even sleeping. I was lying here resting. Darling, you were just snoring. I was just lying here resting. I really was. You shook the whole room. I wasn't even asleep. I can tell you just what I'm thinking. I was thinking. I was thinking, goodness, it's dark now that they've put the street lights out. That's what I was thinking. That was the last thought I thought before you shook me. All right, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, fooled you, fooled you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Honey, 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 honey. Honey, I'm so sorry. You're just driving me crazy. You're snoring like I've never heard anybody snore. What is this, a joke? What is this, Angel Street? Oh, never mind, I'm sorry. Well, what are you trying to do? You were snoring. I was not snoring. I was not sleeping. You just a moment ago spoke to me. I'm wide awake. All right, fine, all right. I'm sorry I said anything, all right? All right. When I first became aware of Mike and Elaine, they were doing what they had done back at the Second City. Paul Sills uh, uh, started a company in Chicago called the Second City, and it was basically a, a, a bunch of very bright students, from mostly from the University of Chicago. And out of Second City, out of Compass, came all of these people. And there they were all in one place, doing startling things, and always inventive. And perhaps most startling of them all was that electric combination of Mike and Elaine, who, besides being as good as anybody in this group, had something else going for them, which is their particular relationship, which sparked and set each other off. Miss Loomis. Yes, sir. Uh, may I speak with you for a moment, please? Certainly. Will you come into my office? Yes. Yes, sir. Miss Loomis, Kravitz tells me you've been coming into the office naked. Yes, sir. Well, can you explain yourself? Well, I have the south office, and there are no windows. It's enormously warm in there, and it's more comfortable to work naked than with clothes. Well, Miss Loomis, but you can't, you can't walk through the offices naked. Well, this is an insurance company. You're not working in a bank, you know. Uh, I've asked him to put it in... Mike office. and Elaine wanted to leave Second City and work as a team. And they came to see me, and in this little office, they began to do improvisational comedy. And I had never seen this technique before. And they asked me to give them a, a line to start the sketch, give them a line to end the sketch, which I did. And they got, and they started, uh, uh, started to do their improvisations. And I was saying to myself, my God, I am finding two people that are writing hilarious, hilarious comedy on their feet. There was no reference, no style, that Mike and Elaine in particular couldn't run with. It was just astonishing. Open wide, please. Looks all right to me. How does it feel? Feels all right. Have you tried chewing on that time? No, I haven't eaten it all. May I take my head off? Yes, please. Thank you. You know, you might just try chewing on that side. Not all the time, of course. Just once or twice to see whether the filling will stay in. I think it's ready. I think I will chew when I leave here. I think I'll go somewhere and just chew and chew and chew. <laughs> you know what's happening, don't you? Yes. I think I do. I never meant for it to happen. No. Nor did I. You know, when you first came into my office and said those few sad words about the tiny tooth in the back of your mouth that was hurting you, I think I knew even then that I felt something for that tooth I wasn't meant to feel. <laughs> Do you know, when I first came into your office, when I saw you standing there so stern in your white smock, I thought, Oh, no, I didn't. It was a shock in my thought. Oh, Reba, no, it didn't. Not only that it was a cavity because dentists understand these things, but because... Well, because it was your cavity, and I think even then I loved it. <laughs> there, I've said it. I do love you. Rinse up, please. <laughs> I'm going to put my head off. No, no, Reba, you needn't 
go. I have something to tell you. I haven't wanted to tell you before because it seemed to me there was no sense upsetting you, but now I've got to tell you. I'm going away. Away? Yes, I've taken a dentist in a pygmy colony. I, I think it's best. Poor devils have never seen a dentist. Rito, I'm going away. You too? I'm going to Saudi Arabia to become a dental assistant. I've never been a dental assistant. Reba, Reba, you know nothing about teeth. I know, but I think I can learn, don't you see? I think that if I can teach one Saudi Arabian the rules of dental hygiene as I have learned them. Oh, Reba, Reba, if it were possible, if it could be that I have taught you something about teeth that you can pass on to Arabia. Oh, Edo. I know more about oral prophylactics now than I've ever known about anything. And it hasn't been wasted all that time in the rowboat talking about upper and lower, molar and canine. I heard every word. Oh, Reba. Oh, Reba. I know now that I'm going to make those pygmies very happy because, do you see, I'll be a happy dentist. Goodbye, Eagle. The way they did a long set piece was by doing it on their feet and then like a sculptor they would take it away and build. Of course sometimes the improvisation you know <laughs> uh, didn't work as it should. Drink this. Well I'm getting smaller. That's what they said in the Japanese store when I bought it. Look. They said it would make you smaller and we'd have a much better. <laughs> <laughs> You can't just be Alice in Wonderland. Of course I can. You can? Mm hmm All right. Drink this. Why, well, I'm getting smaller and smaller. You bet. And smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. And smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. And smaller and smaller. I guess I look like a pretty big bunny to you by now. Yes. You want to get any bigger? I do. <laughs> then <eat> this. <laughs> Delicious. I'm not getting any bigger. I know, but I don't know how to thank you. <laughs> Springsteen was born to run. They were born to improv. Seriously, that's how I look at it. And, uh, and it, it was just a perfect... Uh, th their, their routines were an outgrowth of their, uh, of their genius at improv. You know, even their television commercials were uh, improv. Coming to the stretch, it's Precious Herring in the lead with Black with Sugar behind, followed by Vacuum Cleaner, Ambassadrix, and Mrs. Edelman, who is coming up fast, neck and neck, Precious Herring and Mrs. Edelman. Mrs. Edelman is the winner. Mrs. Edelman wins by a length. Now we take you into the actual winner's circle for the winner, Mrs. Edelman, and the Jack's representative. Uh, Mrs. Edelman, is this the uh, first horse race you've ever won? Yes. Well, it was quite an exciting race from it's where we were in the too. stand. Yes, I was surprised when they let me enter. Have you ever tried Jack's beer? Yes, I find that it's uh, mellow, bright, clear and light, premium brew from 100% natural ingredients to give you real beer taste, which is wonderful. And once I tried Jack's, I was just never again completely satisfied with any other beer. I bet after a race like that, you could use a can of Jack's. Oh, I could use two. <laughs> Mrs. Edelman, will you be entering any more horse races? It depends on Mr. Edelman. Waitress. Uh, yes, can I help you? Uh, yeah, I'd like a glass of Mellow Jacks, please. Premium brewed from 100% natural ingredients to give you real beer taste. Mellow, bright, clear and light Jacks. Very good. Right, and and uh, I'll have the chopped sirloin plate, please. No, don't take the chopped sirloin. Take the chicken. Chicken? Yes. Okay. I'll take the roast chicken. Good, thank you. That's very kind of you. I'll have the roast chicken and uh, a nice green salad. Please. No, no, no. Don't take the salad here. Let me give you a vegetable. All right, fine. Uh, and the uh, coconut custard no, pie. No, no, no. Don't, don't take the pie. Take a pudding. Don't, don't eat the pie here. The crust is no good. Okay, okay fine. All right. And, and, and the Jacks be right away, please. Thank you very much, miss. There's nobody listening, dear. Okay, well, thanks, Mom. It's all right, honey. Only this time, please tip me. I saw Mike and Elaine do a sketch based on their indignation at a particularly outrageous American custom, a custom which Jessica Midford has since called the high cost of dying. Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Welcome to Long Dust. Can I help you? Yes, I read your ad. I'm interested in the $65 funeral. Was that for yourself? No. For another. Uh, may I ask, where did you catch that ad? TV Guide. Just trying to find out where our trade comes from. Um, I am afraid that I'm going to have to ask you some questions. Yes, that's all right. All right. Uh, can you tell me what was the loved one's name? Seymour Maslow Freen. <laughs> Is that hyphenated? It was. <laughs> And the loved one's address? Uh, 441118 Southeast Huguenot Walloon Drive. Uh, and may I ask what your name is? Charlie. Charlie. Charlie, I'm Miss Loomis, your grief lady. Hi. Is it Charlie Maslow Freen? Yes. Yeah. You're related. Uh, well, that will be $65. Thank you. I have the check all made out. Oh, wonderful. Uh, um, before you go, Mr. Mazofreen, I, I was just wondering, would you be interested in some extras for the loved one? What kind of extras? Well, how about a casket? <laughs> It, it, isn't that included in the funeral? No. <laughs> we have to have a casket. Yes, it looks better. <laughs> How much? We have three prices. $1,243, $768, and $14.98. Uh... May I ask, uh, what, what do those prices represent? That's mahogany, oak, and nubby plywood. <laughs> nubby plywood. Uh, tell me, uh, what, what kind of an appearance does that make? Cheap. <laughs> I'll take the oak. Take the oak? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, I am so sorry to intrude this way on your grief. Uh, I just wondered, can you tell me, how had you planned on getting Mr. Maslow Freen down here? <laughs> to give the driver an enormous tip. <laughs> you, don't, you don't happen to have a hearse, do you? Yes, yes we do. For $35, I can give you an exquisite Cadillac slumber wagon. All right, all right. $35. $35. Now, how about someone to drive it? That's not included? No, it isn't. All right, we have to have a driver. I can't drive it myself. No. Um, um Is uh, that all? Uh, just, this is the last, and I am, I am once again truly sorry it is my job. Um, had you planned it all on burying Mr. Maslow? <laughs> That 
was foremost in my mind. Uh, I, do you happen to have a plot? No, but I'm sure you do. Yes, uh, we do. We have three, three prices. prices. Yes. <laughs> $824.46, $493.58, and $10. I'm just curious. What, what happens for $10? For, uh, for $10, we, we have two men who come and uh, take Mr. Maslow Freen away and do God knows what. You always run a little danger with satire, and we occasionally ran into uh, objections from sponsors. Uh, Mike and Elaine, as is widely known, uh, displeased the funeral industry. But still, they could never have gotten into the kind of trouble, for example, that Lenny Bruce did. He was really hitting things very hard, whereas they work with a more delicate, uh, genteel approach. I'm not sure why they were more effective than others. I do think that it has something to do with the intelligence that they brought to it and knowing just where to stop short of the line of vulgarity. Mort Saul and Lenny Bruce and a number of others helped reshape the general sensibility of the younger generation, I mean, our generation at that time. In the beginning of the 60s, uh, Alex Cohen, the producer, had the idea to do an evening of Mike Nichols and Elaine May uh, on Broadway. In those ancient days, we used to have an audience in the theater that was young, for one thing. Nichols and May at the Golden Theater talked about relationships. It was the first time that a man and a woman, or a boy and a girl in, in, in a car or anywhere else, actually talked about having sex, making out, never been done before. The exquisite look of the two of them as the adolescent lovers in the car, it was, was the perfect look. You know, it was what you saw uh, at that time. The hair done immaculately, the, uh, the behavior, the tie, the everything in place. Have you noticed, um, the lake at all? It's just suicidally beautiful tonight. <laughs> just, um, fantastic. It's okay. <laughs> it's really okay. <sighs> That's... Just, I mean, that's just so fantastic to me, you know? Because, I mean, like, um, you look at that, that lake out there, you know, and you think, you know, like, what is it? <laughs> uh, that lake. And it, it's just, you know, it's just a lot of little water. <laughs> and, and then you, you put it all together and it's, it's this entire lake, you know? <laughs> that's... That just knocks me out. <laughs> uh, what do you, uh, what, what do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, I, I, I go right along with you. Uh, th that, that whole deal is very rough. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, there is a full moon. <laughs> Son of a gun. <laughs> That's okay, huh? That's nice. Is that okay? Mm. It's really okay. <laughs> Do 
Do you think you're going to go to college when you get out of here? Um, um, what do you figure? I mean, you know, like, after high school, what then? <laughs> um, what, what, oh, what are your plans? Oh. <clears throat> See, uh, my, my old man w uh, wishes me to attend uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Oh. See, uh, uh, they have this uh, extremely fine engineering department. Oh. And, uh, 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 that's the field I'm going to enter. Oh. So, uh, I, I figure if I can get a basketball scholarship, you know... I mean. Oh, you can so easily. Well, you're, you're this great basketball player, you I know. I don't know. I'm getting soft. Oh, are you kidding? No, look at that. <laughs> oh, you have an absolutely gorgeous build. Are you joking? Would you care to hit me in the stomach? <laughs> With my actual fist? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'll hurt your stomach. No, no, no. Just hurry up, because i got to breathe. <laughs> You've got something in there. <laughs> you are as hard as an actual rock. Yeah. You have an absolutely fantastic skill. That's the way it goes. <laughs> My You think you're going to go to college when you get out of Um, my father says that it's just such a way to open the door for a job. Jenny. Yes? Uh, see, uh, uh, this is the thing. <laughs> I, I only get the car once a week. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, I, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, if a girl likes a boy, she'll ride on the bus. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't think I'm getting across to you. <laughs> see, Ginny, uh, see, the way I figure it, uh, every human being has uh, certain natural urges, and I got them. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, uh, I don't know, uh, what you expected, you know? I mean, I don't know what George Green has told you about me in the last... <laughs> but, uh, just the way, uh, I, uh, figure is that, uh, I mean, you go out with, um, somebody, you know, on your first date, and... <laughs> I mean, you sort of uh, have to uh, talk to them or something. You have to get to know them or something, you know. And then uh, uh, later, um, you know, like when you go out, you know, like on your second day, <laughs> you ever ask me out again, I know it's William, but if you do, <laughs> then, uh, uh, then that's a, a different thing then because, uh, you know, that's uh, later. But you know, this is 
our first date. Ginny, do you know what you're going to say? You want to? No. I, know, I know exactly what you're going to say. You want to know? You're, you're going to say I wouldn't respect you, right? Right? Look, Kenny, I want to tell you right here and now that I would respect you like crazy. <laughs> You can't even imagine how I would respect you. Are you sure you wouldn't just be graceful? No! No. I'm, I'm talking about respect. Well, um, can I ask you something? Okay, uh, this is, um, a very hard question to ask, so, uh, I would appreciate it, really, if you, you know, just tell me the truth, so, okay? Okay. Um, do you like me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I do. Really? Oh, I do. Because, I mean, I just want you to know something. I mean, I, I really like you. I mean, I know you won't believe this. I've never done this before with a boy. I really haven't. I mean, I really like you. I really like you. And I, you really like me? Yeah. Um, okay. You're gonna go to college when you get out. Of you know, I think they set the standard, and then they had to move on because they were directors and writers. They were enormously successful individually. They didn't need each other in that sense, but the fact that they didn't work together anymore has always seemed a true misfortune for all the rest of us. I think that there's no generation that would have seen them, that would not have fallen in love with them. A hundred years from now, if, <laughs> if people could see the, the, this, this team work, it would be no different. No different.